All right, it's time for the next session, which is using the C++ standard and boost libraries in your 32-bit and 64-bit applications with Lee Canty. Welcome, Lee. Hi there. Actually, he's been with us the, the whole time. We've been tag teaming uh, these last three uh, sessions with uh, Lee, Eli, and Bruno. <laughs> We're close. Like, like Bruno mentioned, there's so much inner activity between all the different features. You know, everybody's touching a little bit of everything. Uh, the team works very closely, and, and just want to congratulate congratulate this team again on this delivery. Uh, I know that it was a lot of uh, hard work and and a lot of close working together. So uh, I know our our uh, our guys out there or our developers really appreciate what you've done and are very excited about this, uh, this new release. I, I spent the last week in in uh, Asia, and <clears throat> there's tremendous excitement about uh, language compliance, what that means for using libraries. And um, as well as you know this new architecture and where we're taking it, um, so it's uh, great work all around. I just want to uh, quickly capture a couple of questions that came in. Um, one was, uh, so where can I find this uh, writing C++ friendly Delphi code, uh, Bruno? I'll make it available. It's something that's on our internal Confluence page, but um, I have no problem exporting it to PDF or Word and making it available. So. Um, I left my contact info um, earlier, so whoever it is can email me or just catch me on the forum and um, just let me know. I'll make it available. Well, we should also uh, blog about it or, or uh, put it out on an external reference as well, potentially. Um, okay, so you know we'll continue along this uh, this discussion, but we wanted to switch gears a little. Well, not really switch gears, just kind of go into the next part of it, which is um, you know we talked a lot about tooling and and architecture and language and interop with Dell 5 ECL and framework, but there's another big important part of using C++ and that's being able to use the standard template libraries and, and other libraries like Boost. So um, Lee, why don't you uh, we take a moment and you can introduce yourself to a little bit about your history uh, with these products and technologies and then we'll jump into some specifics on the, the libraries. Sounds good. I'm, uh, I'm responsible basically right now for the Base runtime libraries, merging with sorry about that the uh, the uh, merging in Dinkumware to uh, make it work with our libraries and our compiler, and doing some interop with Delphi RTL. I also work sometimes on uh, numerous tools. In the past, I've worked a lot on the Linker librarian. Almost all the tools you touch in your tool chain at some point. Uh, my fairly long history here. I've been working on them. I started here many, many years ago uh, when I was gone for three, three or four years and then came back uh, when we uh, were getting really excited about the post post builder market. Uh, I guess that's what uh, I, I do this last cycle. I mean, I, sp I probably spent most of this last cycle staring at the CPU view in, our debu in, <laughs> in uh, a debugger of some sort. Right. So we've had talk about uh, taking Clang and, and making it do wonderful things, but the uh, move to Windows has been you know, slow going and challenging, brought with danger and peril. And uh, you know we finally cleared through that and looks like and uh, are able to move forward more quickly now. Sounds a little bit like the an unexpected journey our <laughs> hobbits went <laughs> through. I do like. Sorry, I got hobbits reference. on my mind. Uh, so do I. <laughs> just reread the book, and I'm really looking forward to the movie this Friday. Um, so yeah, you you spend a lot of time looking at uh, you know debugger windows. I, I I know most developers. That's where you spend most of your time in developing code. Is that, yeah, right? If this you're was, doing serious was, development, you're debugging a lot. Right. This was pre debugger debugging. So this is this is the non fun part. <laughs> Right, I kind of wished for uh, yes. Oh, any sort of debugging. any sort of ID debugging would have been great. So, that, and that's one of the challenges that this tool has is they're bootstrapping a lot of uh, a lot of these things. So they may not have full debugger support when they're building certain features. And yeah, I mean, you're looking at uh, binaries and CPU views and stacks and uh, you know, pretty like you said, fraught with peril type of debugging. But we appreciate your effort <laughs> so that we can have the nice experience out here. Thanks. Um, there's a question, are we going to be doing demos in this one? I think uh, we are going to do a few demos. Yeah, I have a few short demos that just uh, show some of the 
some interesting little tidbits. Well, nothing, nothing exciting. It just, uh, oh, maybe the, I think this uh, group will find uh, anything you show us exciting. <laughs> well, let's let's talk a little bit uh, first and more about um, STL and Boost. Um, you mentioned Dinkumware. Um, why why do we use Dinkumware? I mean, there's other STL libraries out there, right? Right, definitely. Are. STL port. I don't know if Rogue Wave is still around. Rogue Wave's not. I mean, not in the same business. I don't believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have history with them. We we use them way back when. And um, I don't remember. Point to the the mic. EC for sure. Yeah. Uh, then we actually used SDL port for a year, but they really slowed down at, at that point. Though I, I understood they they brought it back up somewhat. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of time with them. We've been working with Dinkinware because they're they're um, well established across multiple platforms. Uh, have a very good reputation, are deeply uh, in the C++ committee. Yes, they are. Yeah, and spent a lot of time working on it. And PJ Plugger, yeah. Exactly. Those are the main reasons. Uh, also, when we were on 32-bit uh, especially, uh, it's always nice to have a reference implementation, and that's what Microsoft has gone to mm -hmm. for their uh, standard library. Also. That's right. So yeah. it, it makes sort of a verification process easier at times. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I think most people know why STL is important because it's part of the, the line, you know the spec. Sure. Um, what is the relevance and importance of the Boost library? Why should C plus plus developers care about it? Yeah, well, that, Boost. I mean, I think the, I think the most interesting thing about Boost, I guess, most developers is that um, it, it's sort of a forerunning library where they're pushing um, a lot of interesting things. And and quite a few of those, I believe. I, I looked it up uh, the other day. It was uh, ten of the Boost libraries uh, made into TR1 for C++. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's uh, and are, are going to be in the full standard or already are now. Yep. Uh, and then there's more Boost libraries that are in the pipeline for TR2 with things like file system things. Like that. So would it be fair to call Boost an incubator for future uh, standard libraries? I would think that that's exactly what you'd call it. Just and like HP was with the original STL for it, you know, right? STL. Yes, yeah. um, and I've also noticed that some features that have been available in Boost kind of turned into language uh, standards as well. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, Boost Bind, which exists as STL Bind now, but you can also do as basically the same thing using a, a Lambda expression now. So sometimes these turn into a language feature or part of a language feature, or they become part of the standard library. I remember back when I was participating in the uh, standard committee, there was uh, basically two groups, those that wanted to argue about language and mostly <laughs> syntax, and those that wanted to argue about libraries. And I use argue in the, in the philosophical sense. Uh, you know, Everybody has uh, beliefs about how things should work, and this was a pretty varied group, even though we all had one thing in common. But that library group in particular um, was very adamant and, and very, very involved in, in what they believe should be part of the standard. So we're supporting then Boost uh, version 150, 150, which is pretty close to the latest version. Um, I think they just released 152 recently. They were pretty fast release cycle. Mm -hmm. Back when we started bringing it over, uh, 150 was the current shipping that we had taken. Our our plan will be, of course, to push back enough changes that that it doesn't become an issue. You'll be able to bail out of the box. Mm -hmm. That'll probably take a little bit of time past um, shipping because we'll need to get those together, get the right uh, patches submitted. Mm -hmm. But basically, you know, we have to teach it about the fact there is a BCC sixty four now, right? Uh, and 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 configure you know appropriate configurations. So and it was aware of our previous compiler, and it was aware of our previous compiler, which actually <laughs> so we would trip. Trip through all of those those workarounds, which which may or may not be needed depending on if it's library or language related, mm -hmm. and uh, so we'll be pushing that back. So that, the idea is that we'll want to get it working out of the box, and I, I think you're going to see, um, without revealing much, that we're going to be aggressively pursuing Boost in this release, and and there will be updates, and we are working uh, to get the pass rates up and and to get as many of the libraries really usable as possible. Well, a follow-up question was, uh, what is so special about the Boost libraries, and 
you know, I mentioned at some point, it's it's kind of the it's a library I think that pushes the limit of C++ to right. some extent. This is where people try things out for general acceptance. Uh, so incubator is probably a good way to mm -hmm. put it. Um, so if you're looking for something that you may not be in the standard, you're pretty good chance you're going to find it in Boost. Would you, right. would you say? Definitely, and a lot of convenience things. The standard has been adding a lot more convenience things or or, or platform sorts of things. Uh, that's why you'll see things like file system coming in. And mm -hmm. Basically, you were sort of left to work with your C extensions if you wanted to parse file names, get directories, split those sorts of things. You really, there's no, there's no standard ways of doing it. And um, so T, uh, file system, for example, is scheduled to be part of TR2. And that'll let you say, is this a directory? Shall I remove it? Um, you know, iterate through directories, things like that. All that sort of support, which was um, sort of cobbled on by vendors like Microsoft and ourselves with the find first, find next, and, and those sorts of uh, old C APIs. Right. And to be a little more specific, um, if you, as Lee pointed out, there's these technical reports that come out at, at a different intervals than the actual specification, even though, so in 2007, a, a technical report came out that added some of these boost features into the standard library. In 2011, last year when it was ratified, a bunch more came into the standard. And independent of whenever the next standard is, there's going to be some more stuff added to the library. So this will happen at a more regular uh, interval. And if you're using Boost features, it's in a namespace called Boost. Generally speaking, uh, those things that get pulled in the standard, really it's as simple as changing the namespace, and you got the same functionality. Pretty much seems to be that sometimes the boost one has moved on beyond where the TR was frozen uh, and sometimes compatible ways have had to we'll have to make some changes. But um, um, for instance file system it, it's it's advanced since the TR2 specification one. Mm -hmm. um, but in general it is as simple as that in most of the time. Right. So I think those are probably the, some of the key reasons why boost is a uh, key library for C++ developers. Well, and it's it's reviewed by a lot of people. Uh, people put in suggestions. You can send patches. It, it's it's a well peer reviewed library, put together, you know, well and uses you know good standards, uh, and practices. Speaking of that, have you started to see a lot more C++ 11 language features being used in Boost libraries? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I don't know. To what extent? But we've run across them for sure. There's a lot of um, uses on, on you know, bariatics and um, things like that are being used. I'm not really uh, sure across the board what other features are using. I'm pretty sure they'll they'll spell out what you're supposed to use and not too. So again, if you're a C++ developer, um, of course, STL is is pretty important. But then uh, so is Boost. Um, I think that was like Scott Meyer's 50, number 55 tip for Effective Seals Plus was, or whichever one it was, uh, was get to know Boost. Ah, good, good, yes. Trust Scott Myers when it comes to the C++ for sure. Um, speaking of STL, um, there's been a lot added to the C++ specification. And some of the uh, features or libraries um, we have not been able to support yet. Um, I know, for instance, like the new threading model and um, the use of uh, futures and promise. And, uh, right. So w what does it take to support those kinds of features? Because like, it's not as simple as just saying call this function. Right. You know, what, what kind of things you need to think about when you're implement as an implementer of that library, even though you have Dinkumware, but you have to talk to an RTL that has another notion of threading. Correct. <laughs> um, actually, that's an area that I've not been able to get to. We The, the current version of Dinkumware that we are using doesn't support it. And so it's been on my burner to look at for mid you know this cycle to see where we're at with that. Good, so I think that's gonna be an interesting feature and, and certainly less one we'll see in pun intended future. Um, <laughs> exactly. And you know, again, I wanted to, to just remind folks out there that um, with this release, if there's anything that you're using that uh, you run into issues with, please let us know uh, because we'll be quick to address those. Um, and that includes uh, the uh, standard template library. If you're running into things that don't seem to work correctly we definitely want to know about them as soon as we can. We did have a very uh, involved beta test, but of course, once we get it out to a broader audience and get more usage, um, you know, we're pretty 
sure, we're going to find some things out there, and we want to be able to address this for you pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, it's a one-o product for us, and we're, and we're going to be expecting to see some stuff, but we are we are definitely looking for feedback. So, um, in, in, so with regard to the library versions, because BCC thirty two and BCC sixty four have different language implementations, that means that we have to support different library versions. Um, I know that we are, yes, we and are. we're supporting the later versions on uh, BCC sixty four. Um, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on on that? Well, obviously, it's not something that um, you know I would choose. Uh, but based on a number of factors, um, with timeframes and plans and, and porting and the speed of claim coming up, um, it ended up rolling out this way. I also, you know, we we did look at this and we asked customers uh, as well, many customers, you know, given the choice between having a common library between the two, which it might be a lower version and not have the latest support. Or getting the late, you know, close to the latest on BC sixty four. What is your preference? I remember that yeah. very distinctly. Yes. And by large, the, the preference was get us on the latest. Um, we want to take advantage of the language and library as much as we can in this new tool chain. And as we had talked about, this new tool chain is how we're going to get to other architectures and eventually backport to BCC thirty two as well. So, um, you know, think about moving forward and getting onto this uh, this release and using if defs were needed or using. Um, Various approaches that we've suggested uh, in terms of managing a common source code base uh, between them. So I'd like to open up uh, to all three of you. Um, you know, you guys have, have been working on this uh, for a while, um, and just whenever you like to jump in, I sort of, you know, what do you like most about have your experience of working with this new tool chain? Um, you know, what what is it? Has it made your life easier? How do you see it fixing? Other people's uh, challenges out there. Any thoughts on that? Well, I'll start. Um, it makes my life easier. That's mm -hmm. for sure. But it also makes it easier for me to do certain things that I've been wanting to do for for ages or years. Actually, um, there are there are certain things that we've been wanting to do correctly um, for Delphi compatibility, since that's my my focus. Um, Let's say strong strong type info. You know, I mean, in Delphi, if a property is of type T file name, when you go in the object inspector and you look at it, it gives you a little dot 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 next to it, so that when you click on it, it allows you to pick up a file. If you do that in C++, it doesn't give you that little dot 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 because C++ has already forgotten that it's a T file name. As far as C++ is concerned, it's just a string. Mm -hmm. So it's a string. So you expect it to type in the value, and the main reason is because C++ doesn't have strong type defs. Okay, so. You have a tool chain like Clang. Um, it's still C++, so there's no strong type def. But one of the things that Clang does is it maintains type def in the AST up to the last minute. It's up to you to say I want the canonical type, meaning I want to just strip off all the layers of type def and go to the underlying root raw type. But you don't have to do that. You actually have it. So imagine I'm about to write RTTI out. I'm about to stream the RTTI out to the for, for this particular property, and I look at it and I say, "Oh, it's a two-file name." Instead of writing out string tku string, I can write out t-file name tku string and pop the object inspector. Now gives me the three dots because it's nice. happier with me. So there are things like that. I mean, it's just you know those things have come up over and over again, and I I've. I've told the forum all, we're out of bits, we're out of flags, we're out of memory, we're out of I don't know, whatever reason I've used before. Um, I don't have those excuses anymore, <laughs> and that's great. So That's good. So you're no longer uh, bound by any necessary limitations. Yeah, exactly. And, and there are lots and lots of examples. I mean, it, it applies to various areas. I just picked one that's Delphi compatibility, but, you know, it, it applies to, we are like kids in Candy store. We keep talking about, hey, we could do this. Hey, we could do that. We could. Uh, the thing is, for us to find the time to do all this stuff, right? That would be the challenge. So many opportunities. Yes, exactly. Wonderful. Yeah. Lee, uh, mostly I just enjoy some of the uh, new language features. I love the four range loops. Yeah, those so are nice. Easy. An auto makes it just so. I I, I like to do a lot of uh, you know a lot of my sort of tie together build system sorts of things that I also manage around here a lot. Uh, I do a lot of dynamic language work with it, uh, and and you get a little spoiled just being able to give that <laughs> simple, 
for this and this, go do that. Okay. And, and having that in C++ is just beautiful. Um, the initializer uh, syntax. That's one place, big one for me. Is great. Um, I love having regex built in now, mm -hmm. a decent one. And um, those are probably like the top hit just from what I've got to use. I mean, it's, I really haven't got to use it as much as I would like, really. Mm -hmm. What about you, Life? Well, um, uh, like Lee, I really love um, auto and the new iterators. Um, uh, I'm e extremely happy about the code generation. And then the other thing that's a, a real pet liking of mine is the error messages. The error messages are yeah. really oh, yeah. I forgot to mention. Um, <clears throat> there are all kinds of features that it takes a little bit before you really realize how cool they are. But, for example, they'll do... Um, uh, Soundex matching of symbols. Soundex is a system where you can um, have a couple of different names that are misspelt, and it'll come up with a match between them fairly hmm. reliably. It was actually generated back in 1918, uh, and it's being used in Clang to help you because what wow. it'll do is if you miss, if you do a typo in an identifier, it'll say, you know, don't have the symbol. Did you mean in the other one, which is what you really meant? Right, right. Kind of like uh, Google asking us, uh, did you mean completely off? Right. Yeah, pretty much, <clears throat> and except it's built right into Clang for the error messages. Is that, I got to agree, agree with you on the error messages, too. I, so much more friendly for um, uh, developing and fixing up C++ code. Yep. I definitely agree. I, I had the experience working with templates, and I remember some of those error messages are lengthy and confusing, especially <laughs> yeah. as they expand the, the uh, types. Um and uh, I just had a wonderful experience working with Lambda expressions the other day and trying to uh, use the closure to pull in some, some local variables. And it gave me the, the, the perfect error for me to realize exactly what was going on. It's refreshing. Yes. <laughs> good, good. Um, <clears throat> so, Lee, um, jumping back again to, to libraries a little bit, you know, you, you had wanted to show us a few things, maybe? Yeah, I just had uh, some really quick, quick examples I just sort of hour from the web oh, and sure. the night before sort of thing. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a moment. We'll jump. Uh, have Lee jump into a uh, session on one of his machines. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Great. Uh, this is just a list of some of the, I think, most of the headers that are new. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, this is over the network, so it tends to be a little slow. But there we go. Uh, so generally, this is the, the, the set. Uh, we have uh, a variety of different things. And I'll show you some of these. Uh, some of them are really just performance-oriented, like array and an ordered map, an ordered set. Uh, regex already mentioned. This Tuple's nice, one nice I'm, in. I'm personally happy to Tuple. see. Yeah, great. Tuple, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's nice to have the, uh, the simplified Red and, and mutexes, I've been enjoying too. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's see. A simple example. Uh, so here I'm just setting up some uh, mutexes and then using unique lock just to make a nice simple. Uh, well, it's been running for a while, so like all day long. Uh, let's see. The, uh, so we don't have to free it up. It gets automatically freed at the end of our screen. There are a few threads out there. Uh, TR thread status running along. Uh, am I cutting it out for people? A little bit, yeah. It seems like I'm cutting it out for myself, and I'm right up on it. So. Here, I'll fix the, uh, oh, the mic. There we go. It's okay. Is that... Um, so you can see I, I was acquiring and I was locking it, sleeping for a little while to make sure that uh, my locks were taking effect. And I used a, you know, another lock on the same one here to make sure they weren't stomping on each other. Nothing special, but showing that, that, that spawning off threads, joining to them, is just is simple now. I'm using mutexes. Uh, let's see. Uh... C 
simple little uh, example using regex that basically just parses uh, looking for whether something's an integer or a floating point number. What, so what regex format does this uh, follow? Uh, it's the ENS script is, is at least part of it. I, I haven't actually used all the different flavors. I've mm -hmm. just been playing with the default, which seems to match um, what I'm used to. So, Are you using Perl or some other yeah. language like that? Python, usually, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I won't bother explaining regular expressions because they're um, a little complicated to get into in this few minutes. But basically, we're going to be matching pluses or minuses optionally, and the series of digits is for an integer. For reals, we have optional plus or minus, followed by some digits, may have a period, followed by some more digits, and then we're dealing with scientific notation with the E with plus or minus some uh, exponent. And so we get all excited and we say, well, you know, we always give the 42 first. That's always what we do. Looking good. About one that we the know. The the universe, life, and everything. Exactly. Uh, you know, 4.07e to the minus 12, the real. What about 12, 12, 12? You know, we missed it while we were 12, in 12, here. 12, 12, we did? Yes. <sighs> okay. How about 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12? No, no, no good. Not a number. Simple, simple little app, and then do it out. Uh, so that was, that's uh, just so convenient. Uh, oops, uh, sure. This one, I, it's not so much showing as just noting that, um, well, first off, beautiful for loops. But if we go look here, we, we're calling a function to uh, create this, this vector. And we're returning the vector. And, and assigning it. And the interesting part here is that well, this is a little bit big. So this is the um, R value reference. This is right. right. And the move semantics on the on the containers. Uh, we'll see that we call the make random call right here. And then we just immediately start iterating over and doing it. So the copy that we made inside of that function, we actually it just gets moved into that. Um, so that's very nice. Super great for performance. Yeah, definitely. And um, Garner was talking about it a little bit too. He's like, in the real world, we don't just uh, make copies of everything. Right, exactly. Right? <laughs> you give it. Yeah, you right. own it over. There you go. Exactly. Uh, I just, this was just purely just to show how great initializer lists are. Um, Yay. Oh, and also being able to initialize uh, class members as well now. Yeah. So here, here's our beautiful, just typical hello world cruising through. You know, how much cooler can it get? You know, nice little loop, one seven. Not exciting. And then I was just showing, you know, this is a much more complicated for an initializer list where, where we have a map with a key of a vector of strings, you know, and values of vectors of ints. And here it is just initialized in line right there. So unless you're really dealing with dynamic content, you don't have to look at pushback anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yay. Um, and uh, I had some file system as is, is uh, it's it, it's it's not part of the standard, but we have a version of it in there uh, yet part of the standard. Um, for some reason, did it load? No. So it's this sort of operations that you can do. You know, creating a path, checking to see if it's a directory, removing it, creating directories. Path operations is as simple as saying, oh, I put these things together. Um, and it's overloaded to, to handle uh, putting them together. Uh, and then you know, can test for existence and things like that. Mm -hmm. It would be a very useful library. And uh, I think that was probably most of the examples that I had sitting around. So, so there's a lot that's gone into the C11 standard. Um, we just got a, a question that came up, though, you know, for some of the things you talked about not supporting it, like uh, future, for example. Um, what are our plans uh, for supporting those? Um, and uh, at a high level, I'd like to, to put out there that we intend to update this um, as we go along. So, we're, you know, we do want to fix uh, issues and add uh, some of those missing um, features pretty quickly. We're, I would, I'm not sure what we're allowed to promise, but uh, we're looking at doing Atomic 
Um, I don't know about future yet. We, we're going to require some more investigation on there. Mm -hmm. uh, but currently, we're, we're we're hoping to wedge Atomic in there pretty soon. Um, and then, um, as we go along, you know, fixing up whatever we find that users report, and we're going to try and be very aggressive about making sure we can cover those bases. Yep. And one of the things that we're also going to do, David and I are, are going to. Uh, work on looking at the uh, output from uh, test suites to be able to understand and share our level of support um, up front so that uh, as you guys out there don't have to investigate, uh, we can provide some of that information as well. Right. Uh, here's an interesting question from Ralph. Uh, is there anything in Boost that facilitates multi-core development? Anything that you're aware of in Boost for that? Well, they have a lot of threading support in Boost, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we currently, I believe, we are um, work running fairly well for, we're planning to try and support most of the Boost libraries. There's three right now we're not doing uh, because of the external dependencies, Boost Python, Boost MPI, and um, Graph Parallel. Uh, the rest of them we're mostly working on. We're working on improving the results. I think our last results were more between 85 and 90 percent um, and uh, still working on those going forward. So they do a lot of threading. Uh, I'm not really sure besides the MPI which we're not supporting, um, which other ones since I'm not a heavy boost user at work. So. so we have about 10 more minutes with this uh, group if there's any other questions out there um, from the audience. Oh, here is a question from Michael. Um, how will we be able to compile 64-bit only packages? So the, I, I think the question is, uh, what is, how do I work with the fact that it's a 32-bit IDE and uh, I need to use 64-bit, build 64-bit applications? Okay, well, there are two things. That, if, currently, we do not produce 64-bit packages. Um, the IDE itself consumes 32-bit packages because the IDE is a 32-bit application. So, um, and you can write packages for the IDE for many reasons. You can write packages because you have some components that you want to expose to to the designer so that someone can use them. You can also add uh, write plugins or add-ons for whatever. But let's let's say you have components for the IDE. So those are 32-bit. Fine, you build them with uh, VCD32, and they show up on the palette and uh, the user can drop those components on their form. Now the user switches to 64-bit. Um, the IDE will be aware that those components are not available in package format for 64-bit currently. What it will do, it will actually link you to the static version of the component. So let me give you an example. Let's say we have TCPP web browser, which is one we ship, or TPI, or TC tray icon. We, we have quite a few uh, C++ components. So you can drop those um, while you're in 32-bit on a form or on a data module. It doesn't matter what it is. You can switch your platform to 64-bit. At that point, the ID will link you with a static version of that component, not the dynamic version of the component. That may not be ideal. In some cases, actually, that's not good because you want the component to be using the same copy of um, other things like the system library and, you know. So we are aware of the issue right now. If you can link statically, no problem. You write both the 32-bit and the 64-bit version of the component. The 64 is only in library format, not in package format. And then when you're 64-bit, you link statically, you can do that. Today, you can do that with TCPP web browser, T-Tray, TC-Tray icon, T-Pi, T-Perf, Graph, or all these C++ components. If you need the components in package, like you want them in a VPL because maybe they are shared across multiple, you know, you have a whole application, and that's your deployment. That's, that's the way you, you deploy your application, your partitioning. That's the right word, your application partitioning. Then you will need to wait until we have package support, um, which was just something we knew we couldn't pull at the, in the time frame that we were thinking, so we, we delayed package with support. With the quality that we want to push yeah, with. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you can always build DLLs currently, 64-bit DLLs, but you know, then you have to manage importing, exporting the classes, and you have to manage unit initialization, meaning Delphi unit initialization. So it's something you probably don't want to do unless it's very, very simple things that you're doing. So. Mm -hmm. 
it's doable. It just requires work. So, okay, thank you, Bruno. Um, and so, uh, as a follow-on to my question then about what you liked about this new architecture, um, are there any things that you would like you see coming down the line that you would like to take advantage of that you maybe haven't been able to? You said we talked about this world of possibilities or fix. Um, I mean, what are what are some of your future views on on Clang and and what we're doing with it? I'll, I'll, I have some ideas, I'm sure Lee and I, we, we all have ideas, like I say, we, the positive ones and, and not so positive ones, things, I mean, what I, but I mean, like things we think is really cool and think we things are not too cool. Um, the things that actually I'd like to change are, first of all, the limitations, the things that we did not do this release. For example, um, you cannot debug into Delphi code, okay, when you're linking to Delphi code statically, so that I would like to change. Um, we don't have something equivalent to code guard. Um, but good news is uh, the Clang LLVM group are working or have working solutions for those. Um, we attend the LLVM conferences and um, yearly, and we are you know we, we are excited to know about memory sanitizer, address sanitizer, the various things that they're doing there. Um, there are things like that that basically, um, like I'd like to make the PCH uh, handling a little better, probably. Um, you know, there's, there's just certain things that um, right now in the, the the question is so much. I'm still excited about it, but the the product that we put out is not some features don't match what we had before. And it's only fair if you start with a brand new code base. You have to build up. I mean, VCC and and friends, we've had years and years and years on them. So those are the things that I would like to address. Things that I'm excited about. Uh, <laughs> there are too many of them. Um, I mentioned memory sanitizers, so, uh, kind of a code guard replacement, but there are, um, I'm really excited about something that's in Clang 3.2. I mean, it was in Clang 3.1, but it's really in Clang 3.2. It's called lib tooling. Um, anybody who's doing any, um, staying in contact with Clang or wants to go search that, it's, it's really a way to do rewrites and um, migrating code, but you can easily imagine that as a, as a refactoring tool. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, where C++ has kind of, let's say, lagged behind as far as, let's say, refactoring is an area or find references or, you know, basically the tooling did not allow us to do, BCC was a compiler. When you try to, to make it do IDE productivity features, there was a cost associated with that. So, I mean, we did pull off a class browser, but, you know, there are certain things we couldn't do. Um, with Clang, um, <laughs> it's just a matter of finding time and bodies, so... Uh, those are the things that I'm interested in doing. Are you aware of any kind of static analysis tools uh, in that community? Oh, well, Clang itself has its own checkers mm -hmm. that we expose as audits. Um, right. And um, whether other people are building on top of that, it's very possible. I'm not aware of anybody who's um, doing something. I mean, I'm aware of people who are building new checkers on top of Clang. That, that gets checkers is part of the daily discussions on CFE Dev. And, um, and we would like to do more ourselves um, with audits. And um, but um, I mean, earlier you mentioned profiling and coverage analysis. All that client has has hooks for those. You know, right. just like it's just there. We just whether we can take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are lots and lots of things. When something is like that, so open source and available, everybody and anybody participates, and you just go ahead and figure out what can you use and what how can you make it uh, of value. Right. To, you know. It's a lot like how Boost works, is, and I think the committee looks at the adoption of certain things. You can throw anything in it, but what gets picked up, what gets used? Yeah, I mean, they're very, very selective, and I like that. They don't take just about anything. I mean, they, they, they'll, they'll monitor your changes and send you back to the drawing board multiple times. <laughs> I haven't had the honor of, of submitting yet, but I've watched other people, you know, and, uh, but uh, the end result is something that's a very great quality, so mm -hmm. we hope that our contribution is equally valued and of good quality. So. Indeed. Lee, what do you think? Pretty much the same as, as Bruno as far as, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of work on CodeGuard back in the day. Um, having that, that sort of functionality back would be really exciting. I mean, I still turn it on from time to time <laughs> and it tells me something useful. Definitely. I haven't. Uh, I don't uh, currently use a lot of our audits, um, though. As as that uh, 
landscape improves, I, I think I'll probably be using them more and more. What about you, Eli? Any, uh, any closing thoughts on that? Um, uh, I think areas for improvement, uh, we have lost some of the speediness with this um, tooling upgrade. And I'd like to, and I know, I know where a bunch of it is, and we can go back and get a bunch of it back, I think. But I think that's where I want to, I do want to spend some time on those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> I don't mean speeding this with generated code. That's quite the opposite. We're doing much, much better with that. Right, definitely. Um, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's going to be interesting to, um, uh, look at some of the um, <clears throat> introspection refactoring. There's some, uh, I think Bruno did say that there's some very interesting bits of tooling coming up regarding um, uh, <clears throat> uh, you can make very complicated <clears throat> um, queries into um, the structure of your source code with Clang now. There's some great new libraries coming out from Google for um, not necessarily actually, well, yeah, I guess they are actually refactories. You do very, very interesting queries about different patterns that you're using in your source code, <clears throat> uh, taking advantage of the Clang um, parse trees to do that. And um, it would be nice to expose uh, more of that to our, to our customers. Okay, thanks for your thoughts. Uh, another question came in uh, that I'd address. It. Does Boost have something equivalent to Delphi generics and uh, the language does actually. C++ was one of the first languages to support generics in the form of templates, so use templates. Um, if we, we have a few more minutes, if there's any other questions that, that want to come up, but I'd like to uh, close the session and, and first of all thank uh, you three for participating today. Uh, there's, there is a larger C++ team out there that's put a lot of time and effort into this as well, and I, I thank them for their hard work and for this delivery. Um, we're sure you, you folks are going to enjoy working with the, uh, the new tool chain. It's, it's really set up an opportunity for us to be able to address the larger needs of getting onto new devices and onto new operating systems and deliver the latest and greatest in C++ support. And I, and I hope you learned from this experience or this, from these discussions that um, there's actually a, quite a lot of technology that we have created over the years to deliver the, the best development environment with rapid uh, prototyping and visual development and rich uh, frameworks that you can use to to get to uh, multiple platforms. And, and all this work was bringing in to this new architecture. So um, even though we're getting a lot from this project, we're also bringing a lot to it as well. And um, the combination of them both is something that I'm very uh, excited about. I think it's a very unique offering um, and something that offers, in, in many senses, the best of both worlds in terms of pure C++ and, and uh, the advantages of, uh, of RAD and a visual development. So. Um, you know, thank you for uh, attending and being uh, C++ Builder customers or future C++ Builder customers. And uh, we look forward to continuing to serve your needs uh, as C++ developers and helping you solve uh, the problems that you have out there uh, with application development.